Thanks for joining us on the podcast of the History Teachers Association of New South Wales. My name's Jonathan Dallymore and today's guest is Dr. Michael Malkentine, who's a teacher and historian. Michael must be one of the most productive and busy people I know, so I was very fortunate to steal a little of his time recently to talk about his latest book called Anzac and Aviator, which was published in 2019. This book tells the story of Sir Ross Smith and the England to Australia air race, which took place after the First World War. And Michael and I talked broadly about the book, but also set this conversation up with history extension in mind and tried to explore how he actually constructed this work. This is a well-written and engaging book, but it's also really well thought through from a historian's perspective. So I hope you enjoy this interview with Dr. Michael Malkenty. Hi, Michael. Thank you for joining us. Oh, thanks, Joe. It's lovely to chat to you. So we're here to talk about your most recent book, Anzac and Aviator, which is the, the story of um, Sir Ross Smith and primarily the, the, his experience around the um, England to Australia air race in 1919. I'd like to talk mostly today about the, the construction of this book, but before we get there, perhaps we should just sort of capture the story in brief so that people know what this is all about. Can you do that for us? Yeah, sure. So um, Ross Smith, uh, he was born in uh, South Australia in the 1890s, um, grew up in um, uh, rural South Australia. Um, he was just at that right age to be um, of the generation that went off to fight in the Great War, in the First World War. Uh, he enlisted in the Light Horse. He fought at Gallipoli, um, had a Quite, quite a you know difficult time at Gallipoli, I suppose, as, as most men did there. Um, later in the war, he joined the Australian Flying Corps um, and he trained as a pilot. Um, his Ross Smith became one of probably the most successful and, and highly uh, decorated uh, Australian pilots in the First World War. Um, after the war, he uh, got a job with the RAF, the British Royal Air Force, surveying um, an air route um, across. The Middle East and Asia, um, and that gave him some fairly pertinent experience in long distance flying and essentially air exploration. Uh, and then in 1919, he and his brother Keith uh, put together a crew to compete in um, an air race that the Australian government was holding for the first, um, essentially to, for the first pilot to fly from um, England to Australia. And um, there were several crews that entered in this race. Um, there was a 10,000 pound prize um, and Ross Smith's crew won the race. They flew from England to Australia in the second part of 1919. It took them 28 days. Um, and in doing so, became world famous. It was it was the longest air journey um, in history up to that point. Um, it was enormously significant in terms of the history of um, air travel. It certainly demonstrated to the world what was possible. Um, and then, yeah, Ross. Uh, unfortunately, his life was cut short very soon after that. He um, he uh, he and his brother planned to circumnavigate the world by air. Um, and in 1922, while preparing for that. Um, uh, he had an accident and Ross uh, was killed um, at the age of 29 years. And, um, yeah, for a time in the 1920s, he was probably one of the most famous Australians in the world um, and uh, was for a number of years. Since then, I think, largely faded from our, from our memory um, and our recollection of that time, though. So this is quite a different book for you. I mean, you've, you've published a number of, of um, books now and, and they tend to focus on a much broader perspective. So, for example, your your work on the air war in the First World War is, is quite broad in what it uh, covers in, in some ways, especially compared to this. And so you, you've kind of switched in this case to, to writing biography. And I just wondered if you could maybe talk to us about how writing biography and, and, li and writing about the lives of individuals is different to these other forms of history you've worked on previously. Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. Um, yeah, I hadn't written any biography before I attempted this one. Um, I read a number of biographies to try and work out what worked and what didn't. Um, and actually, the, the guy who supervised my PhD thesis, the late uh, Jeff Gray at UNSW, um, I remember he told me while I was doing my PhD that every good historian should attempt at least one biography. 
Um, and he sort of put the challenge out to me. He said, after you finish your, your thesis, it's something you should should consider doing. Um, and when I found this story, I thought it would make a good story, um, though the main thing for me was the, 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 the records, the papers were extraordinary. Um, and I just thought, yeah, this is a, a book that needs to be written um, because no one had really done it before. Um, but, yeah, approaching it, I suppose, for me, one of the really big challenges was getting the balance right between um, – the specific story that I'm telling about an individual and then the historical context, the broader um, sort of world around them and, and telling the reader just enough context to give meaning to the life that I'm uh, writing about, but also not getting sort of so bogged down that then it becomes a history and not a biography. It's, yeah, really getting that balance right. And I think probably in writing the early chapters, I was erring towards probably telling the reader a lot more about um, about the context and about the world he was living in. Um, and a lot of the early feedback I got from the publisher and from other colleagues who I gave drafts to was, you know, look, essentially he needs to be on every page. Ross Smith needs to be front and centre. You can't keep going off on tangents and talking about all of the context and things um, because it'll just be a book that will be too un big and unwieldy for readers. It's interesting uh, comment that you make there because in one of the recent interviews I did with uh, Mark Edler about his book on um, Stalinism and historiography around Stalinism, he, he makes that comment actually about one of the, the very well-known biographies of Stalin that, it, that it's actually really, in the end, it's not really a biography. It's actually just a kind of a, a massive history of the world and Stalin appears in it, you know. Um, so it was a criticism that he made that that I suppose biographers always have to deal with that balance of context and, and person and so on. Yeah, absolutely. I think it is a key thing. And I think a key consideration there is who who you're writing the book for. Um, you know, I've got on my bookshelf at home, I've got biographies written by academic historians um, in which the person is almost secondary to exploring broader themes, you know, maybe like social class or their ideas. You know, I've read, um, I, I actually think one of my favourite books that I've, I've read and I used to use in my teaching was a, a book about Trotsky that really didn't focus on the details of his life but focused on how his ideology developed over time. And that's really, I think that's okay for a specialist academic audience um, or maybe, you know, history teachers and history students. But um, the book I was writing was for a more general public. I wanted, I was writing a trade um, history. And so I had to really keep in mind that, you um, I'm going to be talking about events and I'm going to be talking about um, phenomenon in the past that my readers might not know a lot about. So I need to tell them enough so that they can understand um, what they need to know to make sense of Ross's life. But obviously I don't want to then go into too much detail and then, yeah, it becomes a history with Ross Smith popping up every now and again. So a big motivation for writing this book is obviously the, the person and, as you said, the story of, of Sir Ross Smith. But equally, it sounds like uh, an inspiration was actually the papers that you came across, these private papers of his. Can you just sort of give us some sense of what these were? Yeah, so um, I came across his private papers when I was researching my PhD thesis, which is on um, Australia's involvement in the first air war. Um, and... When I came across those papers, um, I, I, I thought they were extraordinary. I've honestly spent um, over a decade writing about the First World War. Um, I spent quite a lot of time in the um, private papers at the Australian War Memorial, um, overseas in the UK, um, at a few different places as well. And honestly, these the Ross Smith papers were probably one of the most um, uh, detailed, uh, candid um sets of private papers from a First World War serviceman that I'd ever come across. Um, the bulk of the collection is le are letters that he wrote to his, predominantly his mother, um, but also other members of his family and other friends as well. Um, you know, there's there's well over a thousand pages of letters just to his mother. Um, he wrote to her on a weekly basis from the time he left to go to war in 1914 until the time he arrived home on um, at the end of the air race in 1919. Um, but the letters are 
of themselves of an extraordinary quality. Um, he had this very, very open and candid relationship with his mother. And, you know, whereas in a lot of other First World War soldiers' letters, we see that, especially to mothers, there's a tendency to um, to use euphemisms and to, to skip over details that obviously might be worrying or upsetting um, for, for, for reasons that are quite baffling to me in some respects. Ross Smith was incredibly honest with his mother and incredibly candid um, and also honest about his feelings and his thoughts about things, which was something we often don't see uh, in the letters from men in that period. Um, besides the letters, though, um, there were diaries that he kept at different points um, and there was just a, an enormous amount of other documentation related to particularly the organisation of the flight. Um, and taken together, I thought, look, you know, it'd be hard to write a bad book with records this rich. And I thought, you know, given the story and, and the way that his life would just really fit um, the, you know, the structure of a biography um, quite well, um, plus the papers, I just thought, yeah, this this is an ideal subject, um, you know, to, to write a biography on. So that's, a no that's an enormous collection of material, like a thousand letters plus, you know, diaries plus um, preparation documents and so on for this flight. That must take some fairly disciplined work from your perspective as a historian, you know, in terms of approaching these archives. Can you describe, you know, your processes and what it's like to work with a, a really rich archival um, collection like this? Yeah, so it's my, and look, everyone's got a different practice, I think, um, to this, but it's my practice that um, I like to write and research at the same time. Um, I've never found that I could do all the research, so to speak, and then sit down and do all the writing. And I think um, uh, E.H. Carr, the famous historian in his uh, book, What is History, actually talks about this, and it was the same for him as well, um, this idea that the research we do actually shapes our writing, but then the writing that we're doing also shapes what we're looking for in the archives and, and how we're handling that material. So I see them very much as sort of the two two sides of the same coin. I, I see them as linked um, and, and yeah, I never would, would sort of seek to do all the research and then write. Um, I wrote the book in sections. So I wrote about Rod Smith's early life before the war, then I wrote about his um, service during the war. Then I wrote about the air race. And then I wrote about the um, brief life that he had after the air race. And I basically, in each of those sections, would um, would work my way through the letters and the private papers, which would give me a, usually a pretty good outline of what he was doing and where he was, as well as his personal views on things. And then I would try to branch out and look more contextually. So, um, for example... Uh, his time on Gallipoli um, is one of the times when the letters aren't so great. Um, he doesn't write a lot of letters from Gallipoli or not a lot of letters survive, either one, I'm not sure. Um, so then I branched out and read as many letters and diaries as I could from men in his unit and I had to essentially use those to kind of build up a picture of what he was experiencing at the time and then beyond them looking at the official records, the unit war diaries and things like that. And so essentially I start at the most specific and then build context around it. But the whole time I'm writing and I'm drafting um, as I go because, as I say, I think that then informs what I'm looking for in the records and how I'm using the records as well. Were there any moments where as you're doing this kind of um, parallel parallel task of writing and researching and researching and writing, were there any big moments where you came across evidence, new, new sources, new documents, whatever it was, that, that changed earlier interpretations you'd had and the sources really challenged your earlier sort of views on him? Absolutely, all the time. And um, that's why I just don't know how people wrote books before word processors. Um, you know, when, when you used to have to handwrite, you know, do it all in longhand and then have someone type it up or type it up yourself. So, yeah, I, I was very flexible in that. Um, I, I would say probably an example of that would be um, writing about uh, Ross Smith's early life, um, for which, like most famous personalities in history, the early life uh, is usually the most poorly documented. So it was the, I think it was the part of his life when I had to be most creative and it really stretched me to essentially use very, very few records, very fragmentary um, evidence to reconstruct his childhood. And it's such an important time in, you know, understanding 
the adult that he would become and the, and, and the things that he would later do. I really felt the need to say as much as I could about his childhood. But then what I found is that I'd, I'd written about his childhood and I went on to write about the war. And once the letters started, um, he semi-regularly in the letters would refer to his childhood, um, especially when he was he spent time in, in the UK recovering from an illness that he contracted at Gallipoli. And he would mention um, places that he'd visited as a child when the family was on holidays in the UK. And that allowed me then to go back and fill some details in from his earlier life. And that really... That that process went on right across the book, uh, right up until the time I finished it. And indeed, and I, I think this is probably a, a common experience for many authors, um, as soon as the book came out, you know, people are coming out of the woodwork, emailing me and telling me they've got records and letters and things that I didn't even know existed, um, you know, and uh, that's that's just the way it is. So, but if you didn't, I mean, if you always had that attitude that there was something else to look at, I think you'd never publish anything. Um you know, you'd never be willing to, to relinquish it to the publisher to, to actually put into print. There's a really interesting book you put me onto actually uh, by um, Canadian historian Graham Broad, um, One in a Thousand, which is dealing not uh, not with directly similar things, but also dealing with um, the First World War and, and the um, the war in the air. And it's biographical. And he does a really good job in that book of um, kind of telling the story of both the, you know, his interpretation, so the story of the the person he's writing about, but also the story of how he comes to these views. And he does a really, I think, good job of of capturing this by by sort of saying that, you know, someone else is going to come along probably maybe even soon and look at this material and tell this story in different ways and emphasize different features. And that's totally fine. That's kind of basically what history really is. It's it's you know a collective discussion, if if not anything else, you know. Yeah, absolutely, and um, you know, I, if I can sort of uh, be in, you know a bit indulgent and tell a personal anecdote here, um, when I started writing on this topic, um, about the same month I think I did, or started looking into to doing a book on it and getting together a proposal for the publisher, um, I got I was contacted by a historian in. Um, in the US and he actually got in touch and said, I've, I've read your book on, you know, the first air war and um, I'm interested in writing a biography about Sir Ross Smith. Um, and he sort of told me his plans and we corresponded and, you know, I told him what I knew about the papers, you know, um, and it actually caused me though to really wonder if someone else is working on this book, should I as well? And I spoke to some colleagues about it and look, the advice I got was, um, your book is not going to be definitive. No history book is. So it doesn't matter whether someone else is working on one at the moment or not from a historiographical point of view because eventually there's going to be other books on him anyway. And in any case, as was pointed out to me, look at how many books there are on Winston Churchill. Uh, look at how many books there are on Napoleon. I mean, um, you, you know, hi- history is about... Re- I mean, <laughs> history is about revising and rewriting. So... Um, yeah, it's sort of irrelevant whether there's other books there. I think if there are other books, the question is then how am I going to do something original? Um, how am I going to do something different that's worth doing? Um, and I think the other question that probably, you know, you, you need to sort of consider, uh, you know, if you're writing a book that is about something that's been done before is, you know, how am I um, – how am I going to use what's there and how am I going to build on it? How am I going to use it as a point of departure? Um, now, as it turns out, I've never heard from that guy again. And as far as I know, the book never came out. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's just mine. But, yeah, I do expect that, yeah, there'll be others. And, um, in fact, I really look forward to reading them. One of the things you often hear said about biography is that it's kind of a – uh, a lesser version um, of history in some sense. So there's this uh, maybe a maybe a perception that biography is more for a popular audience, whereas you know real technical history is more thematic or more analytical and stuff like that. I mean, there are plenty of really interesting examples that really buck against that trend, but it does point to this, I guess, general idea that that people bring up a lot of the time about the difference between say academic and popular history do you find as a historian who's worked in sort of both areas there is a bit of a difference or or how do you kind of come to terms with those two sort of themes and ideas 
Yeah, I, look, I think there's definitely a, an enormous difference between the writing that academic historians do and popular historians do. But I do want to sort of preface that by saying I think there is also good history and bad history. Um, and I think that, um, quote, unquote, amateurs, you know, people who haven't done university training and, you know, haven't got PhDs or whatever, um, can write some outstanding history and some really, really, really valuable um uh, representations of the past. By the same token, I've read some absolute garbage by academic historians. Um, so I don't think necessarily the qualification is what makes the difference there. Um, but yeah, there's certainly a difference. And I think um, some of the differences would include, for me, um, when, when, when you're writing academic history, um, very much it has to be about I mean, the goal of it is the creation of new knowledge. So academic historians, whether they're writing an article or a, you know, a longer book, a monograph or a, a full study, will always begin with a literature review. And essentially what that is is saying here's what's been written or here's what's, you know, the research that's been done on my topic. Here's how mine is going to be original and new and, you know, perhaps challenge what's been done or add to it or approach the records in a, in a new way. Um, and in popular history, obviously, you don't need to do that. Um, the, the concern is more about commercial viability. You know, a publisher's looking at, is this going to sell? Is there a market for this? Which, of course, academics don't need to really consider at all. Um, a second aspect to it, I suppose, is that in a lot of academic history, though not all, um, it's, uh, there's got to be a theoretical basis. So part of that sort of introduction, you know, maybe first chapter or whatever we'll be talking about what's the theoretical basis of my project you know am i which which perspective am i taking on this um and also how's that shaped my methodology and my approach um again in in, in popular history and trade history there's just no there's no need for that um readers really aren't interested in um in how you're approaching the archives and um you know I would say that if you wrote a book for a for a mainstream publisher and had either a literature review or a discussion of theory, which are you know absolutely um, typical in academic writing, the publisher would would tell you straight away we're not interested. You need to cut that out. Um, in terms of the style, though, I think a really big difference is that in academic history. Um, the historian very much makes their thinking visible on the page. So they're not just describing what happened in the past or explaining what happened in the past, but they're also explaining how we know what happened in the past. Now, that might be done in the main text where they actually discuss how they're reading the sources um, and they might even acknowledge that there's different ways to read the sources and they might talk about ambiguities in the sources and gaps and problems um, contradictions but that also would typically be done through footnotes um, at the bottom of the page um, or end notes at the end of the chapter or the book um, in popular history that's there's probably a lot less of that um, and really the focus is just on what happened in the past there's the focus on the story on the narrative um, and I think um, I think <sighs> I mean, I tried to do both um, because I do enjoy books where you can actually see, that, in a sense, there's two stories. There's the story that is happening in the past, Ross Smith's life in my case, but there's also the story of how I discovered that life or how I construct, reconstructed that life. As writing a popular history, though, I did have to be careful that that didn't interrupt the narrative too much. Um, because I do need, I needed to respect that a lot of readers wouldn't want that, and I suppose that was one of the challenges writing the book um, was to have a book that um, my academic colleagues would admire and respect um, and see the the craftsmanship in, um, but also a book that um, people who aren't historians, people who just want to read a good story, um, that they could also enjoy and become immersed in in the narrative as well. Um, yeah, and that that was a, that was a tricky balance to strike. I think between um yeah between the academic aspects and the popular aspects of the book I wanted to write. One of the things we don't necessarily talk as much about I think at least in a kind of popular context with history is the many ethical things that go on in the process of of making these sorts of histories and particularly in this case with say the the life of an individual and you're looking at his his what were originally private papers, you know, and, and many of them you're saying are to his mother. That's quite an intimate space that you're entering as a historian. And I I read a couple of years ago um, Mark McKenna's biography, which is absolutely brilliant, of um, Manning Clark, the, the very well-known Australian historian. 
And there were there were quite a few points in that biography where he was really on the page wrestling with the ethics of whether he should be saying these sorts of things and discussing the things that he'd found out because they were quite personal and, they, and in some cases quite difficult. Did you sort of wrestle with that ethical space as you were writing about Ross Smith? Um, not not uh, hugely, and I think partly because um, everything I was using was on the public record. So um, the letters, for example, um, while Ross didn't give permission for them to be um, uh, given to the State Library of South Australia, um, his family did. And there was a time when they were closed, um, public couldn't see the records, but now they're open. So I think I felt the records are on public. Uh, anyone can see them. In fact, since I've written my book, they've been digitised. So, you know, State Library of New South Wales, all the Ross Smith papers are digitised. So I, I didn't feel personally that I um, I was prying into someone's private papers because they were no longer private. They were public. Um, and the same goes, I suppose, for the official records as well. Everything I used was was on the record. There were some private papers that I did use that were closed, but I had to write to family and get their permission. And then I sent a copy of the manuscript or the chapters that, that were relevant to those chap uh, to those papers. I sent them to the families and and asked them to um you know to tell me if they were okay with me using the material in that way so i feel like i met my ethical responsibilities um though i do see if you were using papers that say had not been donated to a public institution i do see certainly that yeah there would be those ethical considerations and i suppose then the question comes back to whoever is the custodian of those papers and the custodian of that person's um memory and their records really up to them to 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 authorize or or not or not I just want to quote quickly from the book here because there's a really interesting concept that you draw out in the preface. So to quote you, uh, to, per to paraphrase John Lewis Gaddis, history is not the past. It is much as a map is to a landscape, a representation of the past. So it's compressed, finite and simplified textual depiction of an infinitely complex reality. Can you just unpack that and tell us how that kind of uh, informs your work as a historian? Yeah, so I use that um, that uh, the book that that's from. It's called um, uh, the Landscape of History. Um, I use that with my history extension students actually, and they've found it really useful. And it's actually a metaphor that we come back to over and over and over again. Um, yeah, so I guess for for me the idea is that um, that that my book it's not it's not Ross Smith's life. It's not his actual real life experience. I believe my philosophy is that that actual life did happen, um, that it only happened in one way. There is a there is a factual, truthful, um, real basis to the life that Ross Smith led. Um, however, that life is gone. And I suppose it's one of the kind of unique things about doing history is that we research, the subject matter that we research is it's no longer there. It's vanished. Um, and, you know, uh, as opposed to other disciplines, they can observe the things biologists can look through the microscope and look at the germs um, and they can manipulate them and actually see them as in real time. But historians can't do that because our subject matter is by its very definition gone. It's the past. What is left for us to work with are fragments, uh, bits and pieces of evidence that um, have either by accident or design um, ended up in our hands. And the best we can do is to represent that past. Um, and even, you know, someone, a topic as finite as an individual person's 29-year life, like Ross Smith, um, there, there were whole weeks, there were whole months. In fact, there were a few years in Ross Smith's life where I had relatively little evidence. In fact, the first 18 years of his life, I didn't have a single word written by him. Um, and, you know, I had to reconstruct that somehow. I had to represent it somehow. Um, and I think for, for my students, it's really been helpful as we've thought about the nature of history. When we look at, so a landscape is infinitely complex. No individual can, can you know, count every leaf on every tree in a landscape, can, can, can contemplate and can comprehend every single contour in the landscape and everything that's going on. Yet we can hold a map in our hands and we can look at it and we can make sense of it and we can understand it. But the only way that we can do that is because it's, taken out and it's put at a scale that we can comprehend it's 
you know, put on a single page. Um, and we use symbols to represent things in landscapes like hills and trees and, and houses or whatever. Likewise, in, in our histories, we, um, we, we focus on single examples or quotes from letters and things to represent larger truths. We generalise. That's what historians have to do. And so I think in many ways, when you pick up a history book, you're picking up a map to the past. And I'd love to be able to take credit for that idea. Obviously, I can't. It's John Lewis Gaddis's, but it, it very much to me... Um, I think almost perfectly sort of describes how I see history and how I see my role as a historian. There's a second quote that I want to quickly pick up here, and it's from the synopsis of the book. And I guess it, it stuck out to me because it, it does speak to the way historians both use language and also the the sort of thought processes that that are going on often in historians' minds as they as they work through their material. And in this particular case, you make this quite what I would call quite a big call about Ross Smith and about particularly the air race and the, and the flight that he took. And the, so the synopsis um, c- comment that I just picked up is um, it's a transcontinental feat, so that is his flight, is a transcontinental feat uh, that will change the world and bring the air age to Australia. That's quite a, in some sense, it's a dramatic comment. And, and I just wanted, wondered if you could talk through how as a historian you come to make these analytical claims and feel confident that you're, you're happy to make such a big claim. Yeah, and and look, you're right there. Um, I think when when historians are doing their work, when they're and when they're presenting their work, um, there's kind of two layers to what's going on. And so, at the most basic level, where we're reporting facts as we find them. So, um, you know, Ross Smith was born in 1892. Um, He attended the Queen's College in um, in Adelaide. Um, He joined the Australian Mounted Cadets. You know, fairly straightforward factual detail. He wrote in his uh, letter to his mother on this date, he wrote this and, you know, a quote, um, which is pretty pretty straightforward. And I feel that we can be quite confident that those things generally are factually correct as historians. Um, but then there's another layer where we have to actually comment on the meaning, um, and that's where the sub, the subjective part of a historian's job comes in, the interpretive part, the creative part to be quite honest. Um, And, yeah, I think that's the point at which historians probably disagree. I mean, no one's going to disagree about Ross Smith's birth date or where he went to school because the evidence is very clear and there's no debate to be had. The debate about the significance of his life, the debate about the significance of his air race, however, that's that's very much up for debate. And, you know, um, other historians I fully expect should um, examine my claim there um, quite, quite rightfully. How can we make that claim? Well, that's the 400 pages that follow that quote. I think hopefully I've made a case to show that he was highly significant, that the things that he did um, did make a difference, um, that they did change the world. Um, But like you say as well, Jono, at the end of the day, we're using language and language is is an imperfect and, and, and subjective tool. That phrase, change the world, I mean, what does that mean? (laughs) Um, You know, it's quite general, to be honest. You know, it is quite a general statement. And and hopefully I've gone into more detail in the book as to how he changed the world. Um, But at some level, historians are always generalising about the past because our puny little human brains simply can't comprehend the enormity of it. Um, So we do to to differing degrees. And that's an example, I think, where I've made quite a significant generalisation but then hopefully backed it up, yeah, through the through the work in the book. I just want to finish up with a, a kind of a specific question about your your work as a historian because you've, I mean, you've you've written several books now, and they they range obviously from biography to to more kind of technical works of military history to the the story of um, the Wright brothers, and you've also even worked on documentaries and things like that. And I suppose one of the things that you do when you're working in any industry, um, like, you know, be it teaching, be it whatever you do um, in life, you you sort of develop, I guess, a kind of a set of principles by which you operate and so on. Do you have, do you have unbreakable rules as a historian that you just, you know, you wouldn't, wouldn't uh, contravene at any point? Yeah, yeah. I think, um, and I hope this doesn't sound glib, but you, you can't make stuff up. Um, you know, and, and I think that's the golden rule as a historian. Now, I want to qualify that with a few things. You, you can't make stuff up. And sometimes as a historian, you'll come across inconvenient truths. So, you know, you'll get this sort of picture in your head of, 
um, you know, what the person you're writing about or, you know, you, you'll get this solution in your mind as to why a certain thing happened the way it did and then you'll come across a piece of evidence that calls that into question and, and upsets the apple cart, so to speak. Um, and at that point, I think really it comes down to the integrity and the ethics of the historian to to be honest about that and to acknowledge it. Um, so while I say you can't make stuff up, um, at the same time I do understand that history is a inherently creative and interpretive and subjective process and that at all times historians are making judgments about um, what to include, what to exclude, about the type of language they're using, about the order to put things in um, and about the significance that they ascribe to certain things. Um, and those judgments, I think, need to be supported by evidence. They need to be linked clearly to evidence. And also there's times in my experience as a historian, um, especially when you're trying to tell a story about the past, when we move away from the hard facts of the documentary evidence and we have to speculate as to why things happened or indeed what happened. Um, you know, I think a, a, a part in the book where I do this is um, Ross Smith was one of the first people to rush to enlist in the um in the AIF in August 1914. Now I don't. He never says in his letters why he does that. Um, but I think it's important to maybe reflect on for a moment, and I, get, I invite my readers to think about why he reflects on. Uh, sorry, why he enlisted, and why indeed he enlisted straight away. Now I don't have a document saying exactly why that happened. I don't have him writing about why he enlisted. However, um, I spent four years looking at his life and particularly looking at his childhood and I feel like I was able to propose some of the influences on his childhood that inspired him to enlist. I looked at the type of education he had. I looked at um, the type of culture that he grew up in, one that venerated military service. I looked at the fact that he'd served in the Mounted Cadets and done very well in that. Um, I looked at the type of men the AIF were looking for at the time and basically that was exactly who Ross Smith happened to be in 1914. Um, the thing is, though, when a historian moves away from the hard facts, so to speak, and starts speculating like I, I do at that point in the book, I think it's very important that they signal that to the reader and that the reader is clear that we're now dealing with the historian's judgment and their um, their opinion their interpretation, as opposed to uh, an inc incontrovertible fact that's that's in the basis of um, of evidence. One of the things that I like, um, one of the things that you said there that I like, that I think is really also important, is that notion that you know historians do have to collect facts; they have to be you know in incorporating those facts into their stories and their interpretations all of the time. But the structure of these these stories and the structure of these interpretations really is a, a kind of point of of great freedom for historians. And you know, I suppose a lot of people would refer to you know people like Hayden White and the and the tropes that you know he he apparently kind of uncovered in that were common in histories and so on. And and you you seem to have played around in some sense with the story in this book because I mean it opens up with a with a really interesting sort of moment in Ross Smith's life and then you you're taken back as a reader into other parts of his life to to pick up the story and pick up the kind of chronological narrative. So you're you're obviously consciously playing around with those structures as well as a historian too, aren't you? Yeah, it's interesting actually. Um, for ages and ages, I didn't know what the prologue of the book would be. Um, it's funny with other books I've written, it's like you know straight away or I, I knew straight away how the book was going to open but it was quite late and I must admit and this totally supports your point there um, I was actually reading um, Marcus Zusak's novel The Book Thief um, people might be familiar with it and um, I got the idea for my prologue from the opening of his novel where he kind of uses these like snippets from the life of the character that are not really connected chronologically but kind of are connected thematically and, and then I decided, well, there's this incredible coincidence in my subject's life, in Ross Smith's life, where the first place that he saw an aeroplane, uh, the place where the England to Australia air race started and the place where he died were actually all the same airfield at Brooklands just outside of London and I thought there's this really kind of poignant, um, quite powerful 
structure to his life that's tied to this place that I had no idea about before I started researching. And I just thought that works so well from a storytelling perspective. Um, I'm not making it up, but it, it worked well from a narrative perspective, which which I thought was really wonderful. Yeah. No, it was a great way to enter the book. And, and, you know, it's like one of those moments where as you're reading, like a novel, actually, you know, things are starting to tie together and, and that sort of thing. So it's sort of makes it, a, I guess, a, an enjoyable experience in, in other ways, you know, as much as learning about the story, it's, a, it's an in, enjoyable journey that you take us on as a, as a writer. So, Michael, um, thanks, thanks so much for taking the time to chat about these things. And um, we could probably talk all day, but we will leave it there and um, wish you all the best for all the other work that you're continuing to do. Oh, thanks, Jonathan. I really appreciate um, yeah being able to chat uh, and I hope it's helpful for, for teachers and students.